Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 10th day of December 2023. Thank you for joining us here at St. Stephen Lutheran Church of Stowe, Ohio. Whether we gather in person or whether we're doing this digitally, we enter together this morning into the second Sunday of the season of Advent. We begin this morning with a lighting of our Advent candle. We praise you, O God, for this circle of light that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, kindle within us the fire of your Spirit, that we may be light shining in the darkness. Enlighten us with your grace that we may welcome others as you have welcomed us. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Blessed be God forever. Amen. We begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who opens the heavens and who draws near to us today, and in drawing near brings salvation. Amen. God is patient and merciful. God desires all to come to repentance. We are gathered together this morning trusting this promise of grace. So let us confess our sin together. Everlasting God, you love justice and you hate wrongdoing. We confess the fear, greed, and self-centeredness that make us reluctant to work together against oppression. We are complicit in systems of exploitation. We choose comfort over courage. We are careless with creation's bounty. So look upon us with mercy. Turn our hearts again to you. Make us glad to do your will and to walk in your ways for the sake of our waiting world. Amen. Hear these great words of assurance. God clothes you with garments of salvation and covers you with robes of righteousness. In the tender compassion of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. God's covenant is eternal, and God's blessing rests upon us all. Amen. The grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed... The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Hey, let's talk telephone. I'd like to talk to you about telephones. Do you know when the idea 
of a telephone first began. Do you know how far back the idea of a telephone goes? Any ideas? The 1600s were the first time that they used a thing, kind of like uh, the cans with the string, that used the string to convey uh, sound. That goes all the way back to the 1600s. That kind of blows my mind, that the idea of a telephone has been around that long. Uh, let's talk telephones. Do you know who invented these? Do you know who invented the telephone? Uh, if you're confused on it, you're right, because the idea is that the invention of a telephone didn't really happen with any one person. You might have named Alexander Graham Bell, but really uh, it existed. Uh, there were two Italians, Manzetti and Miucci. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell is often attributed to him, uh, but really it's the culmination of work done by more than one person. There were all sorts of uh, lawsuits and patent uh, litigation uh, that went around the, the, um, the telephone and the invention of the actual telephone. The idea was around from the 1600s, uh, and uh, who invented it? It's a fuzzy thing. Uh, uh, do you know what Morse code is? What Morse code is? Uh, how a telephone advanced and how the idea of a telephone grew is rooted in 1867 telegraphing and Morse code, right? Uh, in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell is credited with what would become the first U.S. patent for a working variation of a telephone like we know it now. And uh, you wouldn't be able to even picture this. It did not look like uh, we think of a telephone now, but 1876. Do you know when the first United States coast-to-coast -coast telephone call was made? Any ideas? The first coast-to-coast -coast telephone call was placed by Alexander Graham Bell, this guy involved in uh, telephones and their innovation. Uh, he was a teacher of the deaf, which is weird because telephones, and he was working on uh, a way for deaf people to communicate better, and he uh, sort of stumbled into wavelengths and telephones, even though that carries voice. And the first phone call coast to coast was placed by Alexander Graham Bell in 1915. Um, the first transatlantic telephone call, 1927. The first trans-Pacific telephone call, 1934. And uh, I can't say that I understand telephones and how this works. Uh, they are sound waves. Sometimes they're carried through the air. Sometimes they're carried through cables. Uh, it's sort of different things. I don't understand all of how this works. Uh, but uh, we're talking about telephones. Do you know when the first video phone was ever used? Do you know when the first video phone was ever used? And just as a, a little hint to you, uh, it was Nazis in Germany that used the first video phone, 1936, which that sort of blew my mind that it was that early, all right? Do you know when the first automobile telephone was used? 1946, 1946. In 1947, a device called the transistor was invented and that began the movement, and again, I don't understand all the science of this, but that began the movement away from tubes and into microchips. Transistor is a technology that moved us away from tubes, and that affected phones. All right? 1962 was the first time that telephones began to be based on satellites. Satellites came into the picture in 1962. In 1965, uh, we got the first uh, marketed video phone. Remember, that was all the way back in 1936 that the first one was used, but 1965, we got the first sort of on the market one. 1965, all this is earlier than I would have thought, right? The first cell phone call, any ideas on when that was placed? I'm working chronologically. The first cell phone call was placed in 1973. The first cell phone network was uh, created in 1977. And 1981 gave us 1G. You know, we're up to like five, or I'm hearing we're gonna go to 6G soon. And 1981 was 1G, right? Uh, the Motorola brick, that was in 1980. 
that sort of famous cell phone that came out in 1983. All right. What do you think about text messaging? When did text messaging start? Any guesses on when that started? Well, the first text message was sent in 1992. The first smartphone became available to the public in 1993. Text messages were actually before that came out, right? Yeah. Uh, in 2003, phone calls became internet-based. So, for example, you could call Europe or across the world, uh, and it would not have long-distance fees because it was using the internet instead of telephone lines, which had those long-distance fees attached to them. And now, into 2023, do you remember what network we're on now? 1981 was 1G, and 2023, we're on 5G now. And so this is a little bit of brief history, not scientific, because I don't know any of the science, of the telephone. I wanted to talk to you about telephones. And uh, the reason why I wanted to do this is to just uh, burn off or waste a couple minutes of your life with, with uh, semi-useless facts, right? No, not really. Uh, I wanted to enter into the idea of how faith and ultimately the idea of how God works by thinking of the progression of a telephone. Uh, our lives are filled with these invisible ideas or innovations. They are like a splinter in our mind. They're uh, a notion in our soul. And these innovations and these ideas develop, they blossom, they grow, they become something over time. And that was the idea of the telephone there, right? That it is not really the work of any one person, but it's people taking up the story and the technology of a telephone and that in taking it up each in their own place and with their own experience, developing what we have to this day. Can you remember uh, the first time you ever made a phone call? Can you remember the, the phone in your house growing up? And are you holding a cell phone in your hand to watch this? Uh, you know, that's really changed. And what I'm thinking about is not burning off minutes of your life, but what I'm thinking about is the idea of ideas and how they progress. And this is actually a sort of religious idea Religion is an idea, and it's even sort of a technology and a way to communicate that is an idea and that it invites in innovation and moves uh, from thing to thing and is a process and is developed and it is a thing that God is working out. And so why I wanted to spend your time thinking about the telephone is to just point out that's a big example of an idea progressing over time. But what about, what if we thought about ideas and how they move, and maybe not as clearly or as large as telephones, we thought about our own lives as the lives in which ideas are a part of it, and you and I are part of the witness of these ideas, the chain reaction of them that God is at work preserving and keeping and creating the cosmos and God is in relationship to you and I and that there are ideas inside of us that continue to develop and this is a thing that we can witness to and speak to. So I wanted to start by thinking about phones because that's a clear way, a large way that an idea progressed, right? And I wanted to move from that really clear thing into the more sort of theological, faithful, conceptual thing that you are an idea. And within you rests notions and ideas and possible innovations and all sorts of things. And that who you are is a sort of processor and that God includes us in God's work by these ideas that we process and help move along. It may not be as obvious or clear or as large as a telephone, but I wanted you to think about ideas and how they sit within us and how the testimony of faith is the development and the sharing of ideas and their advancement throughout time. And I even wanted you to think about how you are a part of God's work uh, doing that even now. And who you are is important 
because in God's kingdom, uh, these ideas and these innovations rest uh, within us and we are part of advancing the idea of faith and creation and God's kingdom. Proclaiming the gospel is its own sort of innovation and development and process. In today's gospel, but we hear from the first chapter of Mark. And in Mark, uh, we hear God's word uh, beginning. And that beginning word is right in the text. It begins and it comes into the wilderness as an idea that just sort of comes. And that idea comes into John the Baptist, who in Mark appears quite a bit like Elijah. And so already we're seeing that that idea uh, that's showing up in the wilderness and not in the big important centers of Jerusalem or the temple, but in the wilderness, uh, already harkens back to these ideas that have already been existing. And part of the key here is that uh, John the Baptist gets this splinter of an idea, the gospel, the idea, the, the notion, the story of who God is and how God works, and he proclaims it. And uh, it's discontinuous in a way. It breaks with the past. He talks about repentance and needing to be washed, and that has to do with this sort of breaking from the past. You know, if you're going to progress this idea, in some ways you have to be willing to try something new. And so there's a break with the past. They're sitting with our sinfulness and the sinfulness of the world around us and being willing to take the bad out of this story. And that's part of what John the Baptist proclaims. And into his path comes Jesus. And Jesus is baptized. And this is the same baptism into which you and I have been baptized. And it's the same idea like the story of the telephone that's being created over time, you and I are a part of God's unfolding, always coming, and always present kingdom. And so this word of God appears in the wilderness in Mark chapter 1, and it's connected to you and I in the waters of our baptism, and it's discontinuous in that it's a new thing. It doesn't just come in the place where you expect it, but it's uh, continuous in that it builds off of some of these older ideas and does something with them. And I think what's important here for us, uh, the people of innovation and idea, the people of the gospel, the people who are grasped by Christ and the Holy Spirit themselves and made part of God's coming kingdom, is that it's discontinuous, that we have to be willing to die and to have God uh, wipe clean the slates of our sins in order for this idea or for this coming kingdom to get somewhere, and that you and I are a part of this discontinuous sort of break, but also simultaneously continuous, this connection with the past and this unfolding history. And it's also, I think, important to point out uh, from Mark how the people proclaiming the idea tend to point not to themselves, but to something greater, like John the Baptist who's saying, uh, this isn't about me, this is about that work of God that God alone can do. And so he's pointing past himself to the beauty of the innovation and the idea and is making it more about uh, this creator God that's been around from eternity than anything he can do. By the way, that's uh, probably different than the way uh, the Christmas season tends to work where we kind of hear again and again uh, that Christmas is about uh, how well we can uh, purchase things or, or, or how pretty we can make the party. Uh, this seems to point and move in a different direction, and that's maybe that discontinuous thing, that willingness uh, to say God's kingdom is more important than my process, and in that is where God's uh, redemption and resurrections tend to occur. And so what I'm thinking to you, with you about is something like the telephone, an idea that exists and is uh, changed and innovated. And what I'm trying to convince you of this morning is that the gospel is a splinter in your mind, and it is an idea, and it is God, and it is uh, an idea of God's work, and God has planted that idea within us, and God's Holy Spirit is what helps us to die to the things that would block it, but that uh, raises us again from the waters of our baptism into a place that helps with this developing coming kingdom. If you've ever wondered 
uh, what it would look like for Jesus to come and for there to be peace on earth, we need to look no further than the idea that, uh, well, the innovation of that is a work God performs in us. And so I want to take that idea of a telephone and maybe think about it like this. And let's think about it in terms of Christmas and Christmas presents. I believe uh, that you are the keeper of a always growing and always coming idea and salvation that comes from God. And I believe that God plants within you and I, uh, like this processing idea of the telephone, the processing idea of his kingdom. And inside of us is this uh, notion or this idea, and we are part of this uh, ongoing work of God. And that's who we are. And I want to think about this in terms of Christmas presents and what that means. So for me, uh, what I'm thinking about is what it would look like for us to consider who we're going to see over the next few days and weeks. Who are we going to gather with in the holiday season? And what if we were to approach this idea of uh, innovations and witnessing and God's kingdom coming uh, over time like a telephone? Uh, what if we were to approach this idea by thinking of who you and I will visit with or talk on the phone with or uh, uh, get together with over the holiday season? And what if we were to nurture an idea? What if we were to nurture the idea that the person that we're sitting with is valuable and they are loved by God and that that person that we are seated, seated with has gifts or skills. And what if we were to see ourselves as a sort of a discontinuous but new version of John the Baptist himself? And what if we were to look with the people that we were going to gather with and think, oh, you have this hobby that could be used for so many good things. And so for Christmas, I'm going to get you support. And I'm going to get you encouragement. And I'm going to check in with you and see how you're doing in the use of that gift for the world around us. So maybe uh, a person says that they always liked, they've always thought of uh, wanting to try a certain thing. And so for Christmas, you're getting them the belief that they're worth giving it a shot. And you're sitting with them and saying, uh, what would it take for you to try this dream or to try out this gift? And uh, you, in that way, are pointing past yourself and you're pointing past even the person that you're talking to, you're hopefully pointing to the idea of innovation and the gospel and how God gifts us and how those gifts always build and develop. And we can be a part of God's coming kingdom and our Christmas present can be offering support and care. Let's say a person says that they've always wanted to craft more. And so maybe you say, um, you know, for this Christmas, uh, I would like to go with you uh, to this craft store and we purchase uh, a few items and we learn how to make them well. And then maybe we make it for uh, this other loved one or this neighbor and we do that together. And uh, in doing that, we remember that God gives us and God loves us and that God gives us our time together. But God also loves uh, these other folks. And so we sort of show that by this uh, little thing we can pass along to them. You see, I believe that God's word is a splinter in our minds. I believe that it's an idea, an innovation that God continues to be at work at. And I believe that it dwells within us, given to us by God, by God's self, and it comes to us through the waters of our baptism, and it is a splinter, an idea in our mind, like how this telephone developed, how it moved through John the Baptist, who looked like Elijah, and comes through Jesus to us. And I think that the call to repent and to uh, move away from the things that uh, keep our energy from what they should be, uh, our sinfulness, our addictions, our, our uh, anger, our pride, whatever it might be, is real. And I think maybe part of uh, living into Advent is to be prayerful and to be confessing and know that God alone can uh, forgive us for those things. But then to remember after they've been confessed 
that we are able uh, to nurture and to share and to care for ideas and giftedness in ourselves and in others. And in this way, uh, when we do it, if we're very clear that we see this as uh, a gift from God to practice that craft or make that gift for somebody, we are participating in God's kingdom, even if it's uh, in a much smaller way than inventing the telephone. I mean, we're not really inventing telephones by doing this, but we are uh, understanding that uh, in the wilderness uh, of our lives comes this new thing that God does in us. And that it, by the waters of our baptism, we are connected with a long line of faithful people. And that at the root of that faithfulness is the good news of Jesus Christ the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we die and are put to death by God uh, for what we do and for what we do that's wrong, but we place ourselves in the hands of God for this to not be the totality of who we are, and in God's hands our lives rest and we are moved into being nurturing and caring people. And so maybe for Christmas we think of the idea, an idea of remembering who we're going to sit with and thinking about what they may want to try and what they may be good at. And maybe it's the gospel to be graceful and to say, I think you can do it. And to say, I believe that you've been gifted by God and you can accomplish this. And then walking uh, together with them in that. I think the telephone is hard to nail down how it became what it is today and uh, it would be impossible to nail down any one moment that it progressed from cans to smartphones, right? And like that, the kingdom of, of God comes into our midst and you and I are called in the Advent season to be witnesses, to be witnesses to repentance and being washed in the waters of baptism and that these things embrace us and pull us into uh, God's process. And that you and I are capable of giving gifts to others, even in this season, that will be gifts of care and nurture. And that if we do this, and we witness to it, we are now made a part of God's kingdom. We live uh, in a world that, uh, for sure, uh, cares more about telephones or smartphones or cell phones or whatever you want to call it than it does uh, God's kingdom. But maybe you and I can be a part of witnessing to who God is and that idea. And maybe you and I can be a part of God's innovation and God's kingdom as it comes. And in that way, maybe we can be pulled into a season of Christmas in a way that we haven't been in a long time. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, gracious God, and prepare the way in us of your only Son. We know as this world groans in darkness, that it is by his coming that we see the light. We ask, gracious God, that you would strengthen us to find even small ideas to be a part of the process of your kingdom. That you would free us by your spirit to serve you with purified lives. We ask this, having confessed, having gathered around your word, having been promised your spirit in our baptism. We ask this in confidence before our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and who is our Lord. It is he who lives and who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Today is the second Sunday of the season of Advent. And yes, we've come before God to repent and ask for forgiveness, to remember our baptism.
and our being washed from our sins and by God's grace into God's kingdom. We come together this morning to think of ways that we can be part of that kingdom. This is who we are in this season. 